Hello all together and thank you for giving me the chance to tell you some aspects about Holocaust education in German schools and history didactics. If there are questions, please send them to me or bring them with you to our next session. I will also put some more links and additional scans in an extra folder if you like to intensify some of the aspects. We must overcome a narrow view on German history. We need to move away from fixation on negative aspect, says Mark Jongen from the AFD. Hitler and the Nazis were just a blip in our 1000 years of successful German history. Yes, we acknowledge our responsibility for those 12 years. We have a glorious history and that, dear friends, lasted longer than the damned 12 years. Alexander Gauland. Björn Höcke, by the way, former history teacher, criticized the stupid politics of remembrance that robs Germany its collective identity and describes the National Holocaust Memorial in Berlin as a monument of shame planted in the heart of its capital. These quotes were all taken from the right-wing party, the so-called Alternative for Germany, the AFD. They are of the opinion that we should draw a line under the National Socialist past. They see permanent remembrance as a hindrance to national identity. And they are not alone in this view. At the moment, it seems as if they could be part of government in two eastern states of Germany. Reading these quotes makes clear how necessary such meetings like ours are and how commemoration of the Holocaust is in danger in Germany. But let me first of all start with the situation in our schools today. I would li like to give you a short overview over the complicated school system in our state of Baden-Württemberg in southwest Germany and will show you where and how the Holocaust is taught. I would like to give you some challenges our schools and also our society are facing at the moment. And finally, um, with um, end with an idea how we could change our teaching of the Holocaust and maybe make it more effective in reaching our aim of never again. Let's start with a quick view into our school system. As you can see, our school system is quite complicated, but I try to explain what is necessary for our topic. Here with us in Germany, students start with school after kindergarten at the age of six. In the first four years, all students are taught together in primary schools. Then we have different school models. Some students go on the so-called gymnasium, which enables you to study at university. The other students attend the so-called Gemeinschaftsschule or Realschule. Afterwards, they can start with an apprenticeship or continue school to go to university afterwards. There are also schools for students with special educational needs. Sometimes they are taught together with the others in one class. Sometimes they attend special schools for their needs. We will today focus on the so-called Gemeinschaftsschule, where most of the students go to. This charts here show you which subject is taught how many lessons within one school year or during the whole six years. I've marked the subjects in which National Socialism and the Holocaust are or could be taught. In religious studies or ethic, topics related are learning about Jewish religion, traditions, cultural aspects, but also visiting a concentration camp. In German lessons, it could be that pieces of literature are read that are related to the Holocaust. For example, the diary of Anne Frank, the boy in the striped pyjama, or Grafenegg, which is a book about the extermination of disabled people. But of course, it's mainly taught in history lessons. I will show you parts of the curriculum as it is nearly impossible to translate everything. Our curriculum contains very general competencies and topics. The teachers themselves can decide where they want to set their focus. 
But what you can see here is a suggestion published by the state how you could teach the overall competences. Students should be able to explain everyday life in national socialist era that also contains the exclusion of various groups from society until the so-called Entlösung of the Jewish question in concentration camps. But not only Jews were affected, also other victim groups should be part of the history lessons. And they should also be characterized um, in, within the Second World War and students should explain the connection between Holocaust and Second World War. Therefore, students should know the steps of exclusion of Jews from society and form definitions of the terms Shoah and Holocaust. The other chapter in the curriculum which deals with the Holocaust is concentrating on the commemoration of the past. The most important aspects are the singularity of the Holocaust as a planned genocide that killed millions of people. Students should be aware that they as Germans have a special responsibility, if, even if it wasn't them who committed the crimes. But as inhabitants of that country, they have the duty to remember the whole world about what had happened. For that reason, they not only discuss different meanings of the words guilt and responsibility, but also interpret different ways of commemorating, either in their area or also, for example, in Berlin or in the bigger concentration camps. Finally, the curriculum links the present to the past by discussing right-wing symbols and slogans today. Now, what do these information mean for German textbooks? In Germany, textbooks have to be authorized by state government, which means that we have a limited amount of four to five books that are used in schools. But of course, it's allowed to also use other materials from the internet or other books too. But I have had a look into the textbooks to see which material they use to teach the Holocaust. Of course, there are texts explaining what had happened, but I focused on the sources and other materials they used you will find the exact literature and also scans of the books in the attachment. A very popular material of showing the way to extermination camp um, is showing a map of the concentration camps. It not only shows the large amount of camps, but it also shows that the extermination camps were all in the east, not on German border. This way, it wasn't obvious to Germans that actually happened, for example, in Auschwitz. Another way of explaining why Germans accepted the extermination of a whole group of people is by showing examples from school books. In all subjects, the pupils were told that the Jews are the worst group of people you can imagine. Rich, ruthless, devious, scheming. But to put it in one sentence, the Jews are our doom. This way, students learn today how past students were manipulated and also why there was so less defending of the Jews within society. The last example shows an advertisement for a department store in Mannheim in Baden-Württemberg. It says that all clothes that can be bought there were produced from Aryan hands only. It seems absurd today, but it is an example of the effect of the Nuremberg race laws. By using an example from their neighborhood, students see that it also happened right where they live and not only far away in Berlin. When it comes to the actual extermination, there are, of course, photos that were taken when the camps were liberated. For example, the photos with the glasses from Auschwitz that you might know are photos of the survivors. But I would like to show you that there are also different possibilities to show the horror of extermination. The first two pieces here show the actual camp, the well-known entry on the one hand and the plan on the other hand. The plan shows the students how such a camp worked and that it, should, it took only a few SS men to actually control thousands of people. The words work sets you free, on the other hand, shows the absurdity of the system. Work set no one free and no one of the people there really believed that. The only photo as a source I chose shows the ramp in Auschwitz. 
Here people were separated in those who worked and those who directly went into the gas. So many stories are told about this procedure and um, seeing this picture automatically makes you ask questions and feel emotionally touched. The next two pictures are drawings by a survivor of Auschwitz. They don't, actual, they don't show actual people, but they use arts to make reality even worse. One book also includes parts of Night by Elie Wiesel and asks students to think about him as a person but I included a comic printed in one book. It's called The Search and it's published by the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam. It tells the story of grandparents who talk about their survival of the Holocaust to their grandchild. So students here are asked for their thinkings and feelings and should classify the excerpt um, historically. Unfortunately, by the way, there is no English version of that book. The question of commemoration is also a large topic within the curriculum. That's why also textbooks include that aspect. Some books are talking about the Central Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, which also Höcke mentioned, if you remember those quotes um, on the first slide. It's a very abstract, but also very intense memorial. Google it if you don't know it. It might be different to what you have expected, and uh, it challenges visitors to make their own interpretations. A lot smaller kinds of commemoration are so-called Stolpersteine, stumbling blocks. Here you can see the creator putting in a stone and a mat of Mannheim where you can see all the stones. They are normal stones within a sidewalk and you don't actually stumble only with your thoughts. They are built to ask yourself what had happened here. You can find them in front of houses where Jews lived and um, were brought to concentration camps. On each stone you have the name, the date of birth and the date of death. They try to make the Jews present again in our towns and it's possible for students to do, for example, research on the biographies behind them. The curriculum suggests watching Schindler's List. It shows many details about the system of working in concentration camps, but what is often forgotten is that it is also a product of our picture of the Holocaust and not how it really was. Now let's have a look at the challenges today's teachers and also future teachers are facing in Germany. At this moment, there is only one place for Germany that is the site of Israel. That's what we mean when we say Israel's security is German reason of state. This quote is taken from a speech Olaf Scholz held in front of German parliament as a reaction of the attack of Hamas on Israel. It means that the security of Israel is as important as the security of his own country. This is of course due to the special responsibility that comes through the Holocaust. But in the present, this is harder to fulfill. In Germany, we here ask a lot the question, can I criticize the politics of the country of Israel without being anti-Semitic? We have Palestinian students or students from other Arabian countries in our classes whose families suffer every day and of course who have a different meaning. How can we react to their anger? As we are a migration society, we have students from all over the world in our classrooms. The question is, how can I make clear to them that the Holocaust is also relevant to them? How can I ensure that they cannot only critically examine the Holocaust, but also question their own beliefs about other genocides? The right-wing party is using National Socialist words in wrong contexts and with wrong meaning. And this is why they slowly bring them back into society. That's why we have to teach the students these words like Lügenpresse or Gleichgeschaltete Presse, um, so that they know that these, what these words mean and understand what it means if someone uses them. In Germany, right-wing ideas are mostly spread over social media. 
these channels are not controlled and students are left alone with the images shown there. The algorithm also has the effect of self-insurance. This makes it increasingly difficult to break down beliefs recognizing fake news. Um, and recognizing fake news is also made even more difficult in times of AI. Teaching in democracy must also respond to these challenges. Because some of these points that I've just mentioned might not be clear to you, I will add some more links about um, these expressions for you um, under the video. Now let me come to a conclusion, or we could also say let's focus all our information and ideas that we had. In this overview that you can see here, you can see an increase of anti-Semitic tendencies in Germany within the last eight years. And we can also see numbers for that as German police is counting anti-Semitic crime separately. Alone between the 7th of October last year and the end of November 2023, they counted 60, 680 crimes with anti-Semitic backgrounds. That leads us to the question, has our never again approach failed so far? Of course, it's not only the schools who are responsible, but maybe we have to change our approach. I suggest an approach that might sound strange at the first glimpse, because it might differ to what you might have seen and experienced on your own. It's a very unemotional, constructive approach to teaching National Socialism and the Holocaust. But what does that mean? It means not to focus on emotions and empathy. It also means not to put the focus on the victims, but on the perpetrators. That sounds strange because our first reaction to terrible things that happened is to show the people all the suffering to make them immediately think that should never happen again. But does that still work? Don't we experience that people see too much sufferings worldwide in the present? Does focusing on the suffering help to prevent present and future systems to make something like fascism and the Holocaust again? I don't think so. That's why I and also German history didactics in general suggest concentrating on the sources and here especially, especially on the sources of the perpetrators. What advantages would that approach have and how would that look like? Let me make that clear with the help of one source that could be easily used in schools. What do we see here? It's a letter written by a company called Topf and Söhne. This letter is written by the owners of the company that built the ovens for Auschwitz. When having a look at the content, then there are some things that we can say about Auschwitz and about this company. We know there were ovens in Auschwitz. We know, or it seems, as if those ovens were working a lot and that Auschwitz needed a lot of them because this guy um, that we can see here, Mr. Prüfer, has to be there two to three days every week. That means there might have been a big need for these ovens. The engineer, Mr. Prüfer, by the way, a civil person, not essentially working for the SS, was there very often. So he knew about everything that happened there. The people responsible at the company knew exactly what their ovens were built for and what they were used for. And the last sentence, always willing to serve you, we highly recommend ourselves to you. We see that they supported the system. When showing this document to students, questions arise out of their feeling of empathy, by the way, without asking them for being empathetic. Possible questions here could be, why did the company's owners deliver the ovens for Auschwitz? Were they convinced National Socialists? Were they proud to work 
uh, for being chosen or their work is being chosen as the supplier for these ovens? Maybe also, did they see it as a test for the quality of their ovens? And what about Mr. Prefer? Why did he go to Auschwitz, by the way, way more than once? Why didn't he just quit his job? How could he live with the, seeing all these horrible things? Or questions like, where's the letter from? Who published that letter? And what was the intention of publishing that letter? Also, maybe American students could stumble over the last sentence, Heil Hitler, which I think can't be translated properly. Um, and you could um, explain to the pupils that, that nearly every administrational letter in these days were signed like that. By discussing, discussing these questions, also with further material, text, sources and so on, students build up an own narration about the Holocaust. And what effect does that approach now have for historical learning? First of all, students learn how to ask question, questions, which might be the most important competence in our days where we have so many different representations of the truth. With the help of sources like that, we can react to people who tend to deny the Holocaust. These sources, like others, were not kept intentionally. They were produced as part of administrative actions. They were necessary and not written for us today. Books written by victims or their ancestors are different. They are written with a purpose. So one might ask, how could you prove that this really happened? In these sources here, such as, for example, bills written by train companies for every single person brought to Auschwitz, in these sources we have the proof that Auschwitz happened. If we aim at the big goal never again, we have to understand how the Holocaust became and how it worked. That is why we have to focus on those proud engineers who wanted to improve their skills. We have to have a look at administrational stuff who just did their job. We have to examine convinced national socialists and we have to have a look at people who were asking themselves the question of how to behave every single day. Why did they decide to still go to work? This way we can see developments coming today. And also national socialists came into power legally. What do people do at this very moment worldwide to come into power legally and then build up maybe a dictatorship and try to exclude certain groups from society from the nation? All sources from local areas show how the dictatorship was built up within smaller communities. If the dictatorship wouldn't have worked on this low level, on this local basis, it would never have worked on the state level. And also here it includes the question of what could we do today and what do we have to look very carefully at today. The sources about the oven builders of Auschwitz is forcing us to change perspective. We do that automatically. We try to understand the reasons for the actions and the effects they had on the people. We are discussing option, options for actions. For example, were they forced to produce these ovens? No. Also, no one was forced to work in a concentration camp. Maybe one would earn less or wouldn't get any leading position, but every person had a choice. This way, students do not judge quickly um, by using words like perpetrators, victims, resistance fighters, because these judgments are often hard. 
Let's take the example of uh, Graf von Stauffenberg. You might know him from the film with Tom Cruise, Valkyria. Um, the attributes with which he has been described differ a lot. During and also after the Second World War, he was seen as a betrayer because he was weakening German troops with his attack on Hitler. In the film, he is seen as a hero. He was made a resistance fighter. But if you have a closer look, you will see that he was also a perpetrator because he was part of the general stuff and therefore responsible for war actions. He also wasn't part of the bombing of Hitler because he wanted to save the life of Jews. Um, no, it was only because he wanted to save the life of his soldiers, of Germans. So he was a resistance fighter, a perpetrator and a victim because he was sentenced to death. And maybe all of it is true. The constructive approach I have presented helps students see that there cannot only be black and white and that we also shouldn't judge too quickly today and be able to change our opinion if we are proved wrong. All of this shows that historical learning is actually learning of democracy in the present. Last week and also this weekend as we speak, thousands of Germans are protesting against our right-wing party, the AFD, as I said, so-called Alternative for Germany, um, from which also the quotes from the beginning of my presentation were taken. In the picture here you can see where um, Cologne, where 30,000 people showed their opinion because it came out that members of this party have been active parts of the discussion whether millions of Germans and immigrants should be brought, brought to a place outside Germany. Ellie Wiesel, who survived two concentration camp, would have liked that picture. He stated the powerful words with which I would like to end this presentation. We must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Wherever men and women are persecuted because of their race, religion or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe.